Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Splunk.conf19. Brought to you by Splunk. Okay, welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE's live coverage in Las Vegas for Splunk's dot com uh, user conference. Ten years is their anniversary. It's theCUBE's seventh year. I'm John Furrier, your host, with a great guest here, Joe Partlow, CTO of ReliaQuest, recently on the heels of buying ThreatCare, and Marcus Carey and team, congratulations. Thanks Thank for coming you. on. Yeah, yeah, it's been, uh, been a fun month. So obviously security, we love it, but let's take a minute to talk about what you guys do, talk about what your company does, then I got some questions for you. Yeah, so you know, obviously with the increasing cyber threats, uh, you know, uh, Security companies have a lot, or customers have a lot of tools. Uh, it's e easy to get overwhelmed. Um, really causes a lot of confusion. So really, what we're trying to do is we have a, a platform called Gray Matter that is really kind of how we deliver security model management. Which what that means is that's uh, bringing together people, process, technology in a way that's easy to kind of make sense of uh, all the noise. Um, you know, there's there are a lot of features in there that would help monitor the health, uh, the incident response, the hunt, um, any kind of features that you would need from a security. Team. So you guys are a managed service, you said? Or uh, yeah, yeah, a uh, diff little different than a, a traditional MSSP. We um, you know, work very close with uh, the customers. Uh, we work in their environment, we're working side by side with them okay. uh, in their tools, and we're really maturing and getting better visibility in their environment. Just want to get that out, MSSP. For you are, right? That's what you guys are? M-S-S-P-P? -P? Yeah. on steroids, a little, <laughs> bit, little bit different. <laughs> All right, well you guys got some things going on. You got a partnership with Splunk for the dot-com SOC. Oh yeah. Um, talk about that, what's that about here, and what's it showing? Yeah, that, that's been a great experience. Uh, we, we work very close with the Splunk uh, team. Uh, we monitored Splunk corporate uh, from uh, work with security team monitoring them. Uh, so when dot-com came around, it was kind of a natural progression of, hey, uh, you know, Joel and team uh, on their side said, hey, how do we kind of build up the team and, and do a little bit extra? And, and obviously, anywhere that we could help secure .conf, um, it was really cool. I give credit to the team, both teams, uh, standing up a, a new Splunk install, getting everything stood up really in the last few weeks, uh, making sure that every uh, everybody at the pavilion and, and the, the conference in general is protected and, and we're watching for any kind of threat. So it's, it's been great working with the Splunk team. So is that normal procedure that the bad guys want to target the security conferences just to kind of make a statement? Is it more of graffiti kind of mentality? Yeah. It's yeah. a hack kind of like fun? Yeah, or is it just like malicious endpoints that they want to get at here? Oh yeah, there's, there's well, a little bit of a, you know, hey, let's do it for fun and mess with the conference a little bit. So we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. So is my endpoint protected here? My endpoints, my phone and my laptop? Uh, or not, is that the, not the user specific, but any of the conference provided demo stations. Okay, so infrastructure for the equipment, so not me personally. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you were so not I'm monitoring your personal <laughs> machine. <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't care. <laughs> I, don't, I give up my privacy years ago. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting thing. Talk about uh, working with Splunk because, you know, I hear all the time, and again, we're looking at this from an industry-wide perspective. I hear, we got a SOC, they got a SOC. So these SOCs are popping up, you know, right. security operations centers. What is, what is the state of the art for that now? Is it best practice to have a mega, monster SOC or is it distributed? Is it decentralized? What's the current thinking around how to deploy SOCs, circuit operations center or centers? Yeah, we certainly go with a decentralized model. Uh, we need to follow the sun. So we've got operation centers here in Vegas, uh, Tampa and Dublin, uh, really making sure that we've got the full coverage. Uh, but it is working very close with uh, the Splunk SOC. So they've got a phenomenal team and we, we work with them side by side. Uh, obviously we are providing um, a lot of the, uh, the, the tier one, tier two heavy lift, and then we escalate to Splunk team. They're obviously going to know Splunk corporate better than we will, so uh, we, we work very close hand in hand. So you guys acquired ThreatCare, and Marcus Carey's now in the office of the CTO, which you're running. Yes. How is that going to shape ReliaQuest and the, your business? Yeah, the, the acquisition has, has been extremely uh, you know, uh, exciting for us. Uh, you know, after meeting Marcus, uh, I've known of Marcus. He's a very positive influence in the community, uh, but having worked with him, the vision for ThreatCare and the vision for ReliaQuest really closely aligned. So where we want to take uh, the future of security testing, testing controls, making sure upstream controls are working, uh, where ThreatCare wanted to go for that was very much with what we align with, so it made sense to, to partner up. So uh, very excited about that, and I think we'll, we'll roll that into our Gray Matter platform as another capability. Uh, gray Matter, I love the name by the way. I mean, first of all, the security companies have the best names. Right. Mission Control, Gray Matter, <laughs> you know, Red Canary, Canary in the Coal Mine, all good stuff, yeah. uh, all fun, but you know, you guys work hard. So I 
know the product's got to be good. I got to ask you around um, the product vision around the customers and how they're looking at uh, security because you know it's all fun and games until someone's hacked and their business right. is trash or there's ransomware going on. Data protection has become a big part of it. How, what are customers telling you right now in terms of their their fears and aspirations? What do they need? What's on the agenda? I guess for customers right now. Yeah, I think kind of the two biggest fears um, and then the problems that we're trying to address is one just a lack of visibility. Uh, customers have so many things uh, on their network, uh, a lot of mergers and acquisitions, so uh, unfortunately a lot of times the security team is the last one to know when something pops up. Uh, so anything that we can do to increase visibility, and, and, that, and that a lot of times we work very closely with uh, Splunk or the SIM that they have uh, to make sure that happens. And then the other thing I think is, you know, most people you know, want to get more proactive. Uh, you know, SIM and logging by nature is very reactive, so yeah. want to try to get out in front of those threats a little bit more, so anything that we can do to try to get more proactive um, is it, certainly going to be on their, their top of mind. Well, the machine learning toolkit's getting a lot of buzz here at the show. Oh, yeah. That's a really big deal. I think the other thing that I'm seeing and I want to get your reaction to is this concept of diverse data. That's my word, not Splunk's, but the idea of bringing in more data. Sets actually helps machine learning. That's pretty much known by data geeks. Um, but at making data addressable, because data right. seems to be the one thing that is all doing a lot of the automation that takes that heavy, heavy lift and also provides heavy lifting capabilities to set data up to look at stuff. So data is pretty critical. Oh yeah. Data addressability, data diversity, you got to have the data and it's got to be addressable. Oh yeah. In real time and through tools like Fabric Search and other things. What's your reaction to that and thoughts around that? No, I agree 100%. Uh, you know, obviously mo most enterprise customers have a diverse set of data, so trying to search across those data sets, uh, normalize that data, it's, it's a huge task. Um, but to get the visibility that we need, we really need to be able to search these multiple data sets and bring those in to make sense. Whether you're doing threat hunting or responding to alerts, um, or you need it from a compliance standpoint, being able to deal with those diverse data sets uh, is, is a key, key issue. You know, the other thing I want to get your thoughts on, this is something that we've been kind of commenting. I've kind of said, took a position on this kind of from an opinion standpoint, but it's kind of obvious, but it's not necessarily true. But I, my point is, with the data volume going up so massive, mm -hmm. that puts the tips the scales and the advantage for the adversary. Series. Sure. Ransomware is a great example of it. You know, little ransomware now is towns and cities. These ransomware attacks is just one little vector. Oh, yeah. But with the data volume, data is the surface area, not just devices. Oh yeah. So yeah. how is the data piece of it? Uh, and the adversarial advantage, do you think that that makes them stronger, more service area? Or? Yeah, definitely, and that's something that, uh, you know, we, what we're leaning on machine learning for a lot is, is to really kind of make sense of that data. Um, a lot of times you want to baseline that environment and just find out what's normal in the environment, what's not normal, and once you can find that out, then we can start saying, all right, is this malicious or not? Uh, you know, some things that, uh, you know, maybe PowerShell or something in one environment is a huge red flag that, hey, we've been compromised. In another one, hey, that's just a good administrator automating his job, so yeah. making sense of that, um, and then also just the sheer volume of data that, yeah. we, that we see customers dealing with, very easy to hide in if you're doing an attack uh, from an adversary standpoint, so being able to see across that and make sure that you can, at scale, sift through that data and find the actionable event. You know, I was just talking with a friend that I've known from the cloud world, cloud native world, mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about DevOps versus security operations, and those worlds are coming together. There are more operational things than developer things, but yet CISOs that we talk to are fully investing in developer teams. So it's not so much DevOps dogma, if you will, but we got to do DevOps, right. you know, CD, CI, CD pipeline, okay, I get that. Sure. But developers play a critical role in the future security architecture, but at the end of the day, it's still operations. Mm -hmm. So this is the new DevOps or SecOps, whatever it's called these days. What's your, how, do, how do customers solve this problem? Because it, it is operational, whether it's industrial IoT or IoT or mm -hmm. cloud native microservices to on-premise security practices with endpoints, I mean. Oh yeah. Uh, the, the thing we see that, that kind of gets those teams the most success is making sure they're working with those teams. So having security siloed off by itself, um, I think we've kind of proven in the past that doesn't work, right? So get them involved with their development teams, get them involved with their net ops or, or you know, sec ops teams, making sure they're working together so that security teams can be an enabler. Uh, they don't want to be the, uh, the team that says no to everything. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, most companies are not in the business of security. They're in the business of making widgets or selling yeah. widgets or whatever it is. So making sure that the security Building teams are working 
issue, right? Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. an app issue. Exactly, making sure that they're kind of involved in that life cycle so that, not that they can you know, define what that needs to be, but at least be aware of, hey, this is something we need to watch out for, get visibility into, and, and keep the process moving. All right, let's talk about Splunk. Let's talk about their role in the enterprise. Obviously, uh, Enterprise Suite 6.0 is shipping, general availability. How are you guys deploying and optimizing Splunk for customers? What are some of the killer use cases that's there and new ones emerging? Yeah, I, we, we provide you know, really kind of three core areas uh, for Splunk customers. Uh, you know, one is obviously making sure that the platform is healthy. So a lot of times we'll go into uh, a customer that uh, yeah, maybe they, they, their Splunk team has turned over or they've rapidly expanded and, and you know, quickly kind of overwhelming the system that's there. So making sure that the, the architecture is correct, maintained, patched, upgraded, and they're really taking advantage of the power of Splunk uh, from an engineering standpoint. Uh, also another key area is building content. So as we were discussing earlier, making sure that we've got the visibility and all that data coming in, we've got to make sure that, okay, are we parsing that data correctly? Are we creating the appropriate alerts and dashboards and reports and we can see what's going on? Um, and then the last piece is actually taking, you know, obviously taking action on those. So uh, from an incident response standpoint, watching those alerts and watching that content fire yeah. and making sure that we're escalating and working with the customer yeah. security team. Yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts, final question on the, um, first of all, great great insight, I totally love that. Oh, As customers who are, first of all, Splunk, we, uh, by our data, is number one third party app for blogs work and app, work, app workloads and in cloud as well. As more clients that you have rely more on cloud, AWS for instance, oh, yeah. they have Security Hub. They're deploying some, they're starting to lean on cloud providers, hyperscale cloud providers for security. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't diminish the role Splunk plays. So there's a right. lot of people that are debating, well, the cloud's going to eat Splunk's lunch. And so, but I don't think that's the case. I want right. to get your thoughts of it because they're symbiotic. Oh yeah. So what's your thoughts on the relationship to the cloud providers, to the Splunk customer who's also going to potentially move to the cloud and have a, oh, yeah. Hybrid cloud environment. Yeah, and, and I would I would agree. There's, you know, they're going to exist side by side for a long time. Uh, most environments that we see are hybrid environments. Uh, while most organizations do have a cloud first initiative, uh, there's still a lot of on-prem stuff. So uh, Splunk is still going to be a, a key cornerstone of just getting that data. Where I do see is maybe uh, you know in those cloud platforms, um, kind of stretching the reach of Splunk of hey, let's let's filter and parse this stuff maybe closer to the source and make sure that we're getting the actionable things into our Splunk ES dashboards and things like that, so that we can really make sure that we're getting the, the good stuff. And maybe you know the stuff that's not actionable, we'll leave up in our, our AWS environment. Um, and that's that's a lot of the technology that Splunk's coming out with that's able to search those other environments is going to be really key, I think, for that. Where you don't have to kind of use up all your licensing to bring that non-actionable data in, but you're still able to search across. But that doesn't sound like a core Splunk service. It's more That's more of an operational choice. Sure. Less of a core thing. You mentioned that you think Splunk's going to sit side by side for the clouds. What, what gives you that insight? Uh, what's uh, what's uh, what's telling you that that's going to happen? What's the yeah? Data? You still need the core functionality of Splunk. You know, what Splunk provides is uh, you know it's it's a great way to bring data yeah. in. It parses it uh, extremely well. Um, having those uh, you know correlated you know, correlation yeah. engines and searches um, that's that's very nice to have that prepackaged. Doing that from scratch, uh, you can certainly there's other tools that can bring data in, but that's a heavy lift to try to <laughs> recreate the wheel for so to speak. We're here with Joe Partlow, CTO of ReliaQuest, uh, partner with Splunk, setting up the dot conf sock for the exhibits and all the infrastructure. Um, final question, yeah. what's the coolest thing going on at dot conf this year? What's, what should customers or geeks look at that's cool and relevant that you think should be top line, top couple things? Yeah, I, 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 uh, one of the things I liked the most out of the keynote was uh, the whole uh, Porsche use case with the, the AR augmentation. Um, I thought that was really, really cool. Um, and then obviously the new features that are coming out with, with the FS and some of the other uh, you know, pricing models. So it's definitely an exciting time to be a partner of Splunk. All right, Joe, thanks. I'm John Furrier here with theCUBE live in Las Vegas. Day two of three days of coverage at .conf. Their 10th year anniversary, our seventh year covering with SiliconANGLE theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching. We'll be right back. Thank <laughs> you.